Good afternoon and um, a warm welcome to this uh, closing plenary of the World Economic Forum on uh, uh, the Middle East and uh, North Africa 2015. In this um, uh, summit, we have had a special program on uh, addressing violent extremism. Uh, it's uh, well known that uh, in this region, but also globally, there's a growing challenge of uh, extremism uh, generated locally and regionally and globally, and there is an increasing demand for responses which are joint responses. That's why we call this panel a shared responsibility. We believe that this is something that has to be dealt with by governments, by all means, international organizations, but also by the private sector, by businesses and uh, non-governmental organizations alike. We have an excellent panel to help um, inspire us and to lead the discussion on this. Uh, we have uh, six speakers and one hour, so we have to be very effective in the use of our time. And we have representatives from government, from uh, civil society, uh, and from business. And we have representatives from the region, but also from Europe and uh, North America. With me, I have uh, Vice President of Iraq, Mr. Ayad Alavi. Welcome. Um, I have uh, uh, Mr. Suleiman Bakit, who is the founder and CEO of uh, Hero Factor in Jordan. I have the, um, uh, the president of, uh, of Kosovo, um, second to the vice uh, president of Iraq, um, Madam Afitete Yaga, uh, who is also, by the way, a former deputy director general of Kosovo police. So she's also been involved in this from the police angle. Uh, I have the uh, Deputy Prime Minister of Iraq, Mr. Saleh Mohammed Al Mutlak. I have uh, a good friend of the forum and a strong voice for uh, the business engagement in this, uh, in this area, and one of the people who inspired us to take on this job, Mr. Mohammed Jafar, who is Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of the Kuwait Danish uh, Diary Company in Kuwait. And then we have, uh, last but not least, the uh, U.S. Undersecretary of State for Civilian Security, Democracy and Human Rights, uh, uh, Sarah Sewell, uh, with us as well. So that's the cast. Uh, before I ask the panelists to start uh, their, uh, some short interventions, I want to share with you a couple of impressions from uh, the private program. And uh, I can't do full justice to what happened because there were so many ideas that came up and there were so many concrete and practical proposals for how we can work on this. I just want to say that we will take all of these proposals very seriously and work on them in the weeks and months and years to come to try to develop further uh, a joint approach to this very serious issue. But a few points that I want to share with you which in order to frame the discussion. First, this must be understood as a global phenomenon. It is not only a phenomenon from this region. It hurts this region very much, but recruitment is global uh, and action is also global, the negative action, the acts, the violent acts of extremists. And I wanted just to share with you very quickly a personal story, because in most of my career, I have been traveling to places of conflict and war and taking security precautions. But when I come, came back to my home country, Norway, I always thought I was back in a peaceful place. We can relax. And then we were hit by a very severe terrorist attack. Uh, on the 22nd of July 2011, which I was almost hit by twice. First, uh, because the government headquarters were attacked and I was part of the government. And a few hours later, I learned that my own son, who was on the island that was attacked by the same murderer, was one of the people who almost got killed, although he survived and was able to swim away from the island, where many of his friends were killed. They were killed by a white supremacist alleged Christian European born, in, born and bred in Norway who was not poor and, and not necessarily a loser in socioeconomic terms. If you look at the way he, was, he came into this, it's very similar to the way we see many of the people who recruited to ISIS or Daesh is being recruited. I'm just mentioning that to say that this is a global phenomenon and let us not reduce it just to a regional issue. Second point is that we know that there is a fight and we'll hear now in a second from the vice President, uh, how acute and dramatic this fight is right now. It's, it's current, it needs measures now, and I think everybody here understands that there must be a military dimension to the response. But I ho hope that everybody also understands 
that there is no final military solution. We need long-term solutions to long-term problems. If we have a strategic challenge, we cannot solve it just by tactics. So it's very important to connect the broad picture of economic opportunity, of jobs, fair jobs, growth, political and economic exclusion, societal change in the right direction to this broader picture. So these are the things we were think, talking about over these three days in the special program. I will now uh, invite the, um, um, uh, the, the Vice President of Iraq, Mr. Ayad Alavi, uh, to take us into what's happening right now in your country, what is the challenge, and where are you in, in this very moment in the fight? Arabic or English? If you like Arabic, we have. Just give people one second. The biggest challenge that we face uh, is extremism and terrorism in the world and in Iraq in particular, and of course in the region as a whole has uh, repercussions on the international level, and they're evident and clear. And these repercussions are either connected to the recruitment of fighters uh, from Western countries and other countries as well, or in the uh, forced migration and displacement uh, of millions uh, all over the world. And we all know the problems that are happening to these migrants uh, who are forced to emigrate, a lot of them uh, drown in the sea as they are searching for uh, a secure place to live. In addition, there are also the practical implications, uh, military, economic, uh, as well as uh, the effect on the flow of oil and uh, projects and its impact also on investors in Iraq and Syria. And if we talk about the implications of uh, terrorism and extremism, we notice that it is becoming more rooted in the area in terms of their modus operandi and their activities. The reasons, well, there are multiple reasons. It will be difficult to summarize. And all of these reasons are important, but we need to look at how we can get out of this rut of this problem. We need to adopt clear strategies. Some of them will be military strategies to deal with the current crisis and this military effort that is needed to overcome uh, terrorist organizations represented by ISIS needs to uh, be based on clear intelligence sharing to uh, know exactly what are the weak points and the strong points of ISIS. Uh, we need to have also the uh, special uh, operations, special forces. We also need to uh, prevent them from uh, being able to uh, move freely. And it has to be in coordination between the intelligence services and the military. And also, we need to strengthen the forces on the ground. This military victory is not sufficient on its own without coordination between all the countries that have the, a shared position against uh, terrorism. And even if this coordination takes place, we will find another dilemma, we'll meet another dilemma, and that is uh, the difficult uh, economic and political situation, which means that when we develop these strategies, we need to have one clear strategy dealing with the uh, political victory and economic victory through uh, developing uh, conducive economic uh, environments that are uh, community friendly. Uh, because what we see now is uh, a lot of poverty spreading within the society, especially amongst uh, the young. So the political victory is connected and it complements the military victory. And at the same time, we need to ensure its sustainability. And the sustainability of this victory will come through uh, putting a lot of checks and balances. And starting with the uh, political reconciliation and, uh, and developing uh, or reviewing education uh, and 
other issues uh, that will ensure sustainability and that will stop youth from resorting to extremism. We need a lot of political reform. There are many countries that need political reform and economic reform, and this reform needs to guarantee the unity and integrity of these societies. The final victory and the sustainability of this victory will be achieved by ensuring that there are no more IDPs, no more refugees, and finding permanent solutions for the refugees and to bring back the IDPs and the refugees to their homes and to their cities and villages and to ensure that they are an active component of the community and to achieve social unity for fear that uh, the current situation will continue and the continuation of the uh, immigration and the demographic, demographic change uh, that has happened because of this immigration. This threatens the whole region and threatens that we will face wars, that uh, endless wars. I will stop here to give the opportunity to the others, and I can speak more in the Q&A session. Mr. Vice President, for those comments, I'm sure we come back to many of those points on education and political and economic reform very soon. I'd now like to go to the opposite end of the, uh, of the panel here, to Mr. Suleiman Bakit, who was involved in, uh, in the side uh, program that I mentioned. And I know that you've been watching very closely also on grassroots level. What is it actually? that takes people, that brings people to join Daesh or ISIS or similar movement? What is the root cause or what is the motivation factors? Please. Sure. Um, everything begins with a story, so allow me to share a small story with you. Uh, when I came back to Jordan and started doing my work, I went to focus and did focus groups talking to the youth in Jordan, uh, kids, and I asked them a simple question. Who are your heroes? And I was shocked at the response. Um, they looked at me and said, well, what do you mean? What does that mean? Um, uh, like, we don't really have any real heroes, but um, we hear a lot about Miladin Zarqawi. I'm like, well, what do you hear about them? They said, well, we hear that, he, that, that they protect us, they defend us. I'm like, defend you against whom? Against the government and against America and the West because they're out there to kill us, which is extremist narrative 101. So I started giving them comic books for free. Came back a few months later, asked them the same exact question. Not a single kid was talking about Miladin Zarqawi. They're all talking about the comic book characters. And this highlights a very important point the lack of anti Ladins in our culture, the lack of positive heroes, positive role models that can provide these kids with an alternative hero journey. The biggest threat we face in the Middle East is terrorism disguised as heroism. This is how they sell uh, extremism to kids. Part of the problem with the counter-narratives all over the world is our counter-narrative for, for most governments is don't be a terrorist for the youth. In fact, what the extremists are telling them is come, be a hero, which is a lot more attractive. In fact, this is actually consistent with a lot of the data and the research. The latest research actually shows that the reason why all these extremists and all these youth join these extremist groups from the very beginning is because it provides them with a sense of purpose, sense of identity, the glamorous call to adventure. And they package it as a hero journey. And uh, shortly after I started publishing the comic books, I got attacked outside of my office in Jordan with a razor blade across my face, and that's how I got this scar, in an effort to try and stop me from doing my work. Two things happened as a result. One, my dating life improved exponentially. Uh, two more important, uh, I remembered what Rumi said. Uh, Rumi said, uh, the wounds are the place where the, where the light comes in. But it's also, I think he was half right, it's also where the light shines from. And that's, ladies and gentlemen, is the kind of heroism we want to teach the kids. A different kind of heroism that's based on narratives of hope, resilience, connection to others, uh, tolerance, women and female heroes. And that's an incredibly important point. Thank you so much, uh, Suleiman. Thank you. A lot of important lessons there, and again, echoed by many of the participants in the special program saying exactly that. It's not only about grievance, it's about people finding meaning and purpose in a complex world. And unfortunately, that's what we're seeing globally, that people look for simple solutions to very complex issues. And one of them seems to be Daesh or ISIS. Come back to that in a second. Uh, Mr. Jafar. Uh, uh, the, the businessman on the panel, but also uh, with a strong heart for this issue. You, you've been in, uh, in very instrumental in, in telling us that we need to step up to the plate. Now, what do you tell your fellow business uh, people present? I think we have a, an important role to play in amplifying the message 
that the um, NGOs are, are broadcasting. And um, in working in partnership, uh, I think this private-public partnership is a new concept in our part of the world. So we have to make sure that the process is right and is successful. What we can do, we're good at marketing businesses. We can, we can hit um, the fake Islamic State. We, we have to rebrand them. Why are we espousing their own branding? It's about time someone came and said, we're not going to call you by the name that you've chosen. We're going to call you by what you really are, FIS or something like that. And that's a responsibility for the media in general to do. Um, what we need to ensure is that their dominance of the airwaves ends. And it has to end as quickly as possible. The damage that they are doing is not only affecting people in the West and children in their homes. They have reframed the understanding of Islam within the Muslim world. They haven't hijacked uh, the religion. They have relabeled it. And the future generations, the five and six and eight-year-old kids, your children at home, who have iPhones in their pockets, are exposed on a daily basis to this poison. If you don't do anything about it, the problem that you see today is going to be nothing compared to the problem that we will see in 10 and 20 years' time. Back to business. We have to quantify the cost of doing nothing. We have to find out in our schools, in our mosques, how many people think in an extreme way. What's the breadth, what's the depth of that th thinking? And if we do nothing, will the problem jump from a scale of 10, which is the worst possible today, to a scale of 20 tomorrow? So let's quantify the problem and let's do something about it through a public-private partnership on a regional basis. Let's x-ray the problem on a country-by-country -country basis. The needs of Jordan are different from the needs of Kuwait, from the needs of Saudi Arabia. Let's find out what the problem is together from a business perspective, and let us beat those people with less funds than um, uh, ISIS has committed. You know, if you ask yourself, how did ISIS come to prominence? What's their marketing budget? Uh, and what's our marketing budget? And what are we going to do about it? So I think the business community, let's come with innovation. Let's come with um, a, a, a change in approach. And if they are marketing um, joining this gangster club uh, because you become a hero, we have to think, what are we marketing? What are we selling to the kids? Um, and I think if business can join forces with the NGOs to amplify their stories using business techniques and best-in-class um, you know, knowledge of the web, working with people like um, you know, Google, others with algorithms, so that we can actually send this message to those that matter, that would be a great, great uh, achievement. And uh, I hope that the business community will um, will reach within its arsenal of technical knowledge within, and, and also speak with, you know, let's put our money where our mouth is. Let's also come and fund these projects in a way that makes a measurable difference. I think measurable difference is important. A strong appeal also to the private sector, which we from the World Economic Forum strongly would like to echo, and that's why we're putting such an emphasis on this. <coughs> and the Secretary Seawalt, uh, President Obama, Secretary Kerry and yourself uh, seems very committed to that. And I had the pleasure of uh, representing the forum uh, at the White House summit in February, uh, which was very much a multi-stakeholder effort. Can you say a little bit more about how the US administration is planning to take this forward? Thank you, Espen. Um, the, you are absolutely right. The president and the secretary are, have really begun an important reevaluation of our overall approach to violent extremism. And I'd like to explain that. I'd like to talk about some of the challenges that we see ahead, and then I'd like to talk briefly about some of the international architecture and process in which we are participating and of which our conversation ha is now a part. So really, the President 
last UNGA, and then the secretary, when he was with you at Davos, began to speak about a theme that emerged in the White House summit in which you participated. And that is the need to think about the fact that we have invested hundreds of millions of dollars, lives, energy, and effort in uh, an effort to combat terrorism that is absolutely crucial, but in important respects has clearly been insufficient because the problem has continued to spread. And that is what has really led to this internalization within the United States government about the need to address root causes and underlying push factors that have so far not been the centerpiece of the global effort against terrorism and violent extremism. And so at the summit, the emphasis was on a much broader and more inclusive community to include business partners, civil society, a much more preventive, proactive, positive approach that looks toward issues of socioeconomic uh, opportunity, political inclusion, relationships between government and communities, health of communities themselves so that they can become more resilient to the nihilism and lies and propaganda of terrorist organizations. And so the, the, the White House summit, I think, really epitomized a global, a, a new opening for the global conversation about terrorism, one that, that moved us to broaden our response in very exciting directions. Now, there are some specific challenges that were really highlighted despite the excitement of our conviction that we needed to be getting ahead of the next ISIL and thinking about the next generation challenge. And that had to do with a better understand, the need for a better understanding among all of the many variables that lead people to extremism. And to think about it both at the level of individual recruitment, but also at the level of community engagement. So for example, we need to disaggregate between ideology that pulls people and different kinds of factors that will be very unique depending on the local circumstance, the country, the region, the town, the community within the town. We need to understand where the primary factors lie because we don't have the resources nor do we have the time to make every country perfect. We have to identify the seams and vulnerabilities within our communities and really address concentrated efforts there. And so the, 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 the emphasis on needing to diagnose specifically what the drivers are and then integrating our efforts so that we address all of those relevant drivers for that particular community comprehensively and in a united way, that's a really tall order. And that requires enormous integration of the civil society organizations that are on the ground working with these communities with the private sector that very much understands and can help drive and expand the futures for these communities with the governments that are charged for the, the, the safety of these communities. So there are, are significant challenges ahead, but it's very exciting that the global conversation has begun to turn. And so following on the White House summit, which was just in February, there are now a host of regional summits going on. I just came from one in Tirana, Albania, that was a Balkans regional summit on countering violent extremism. There will be nearly a dozen more occurring, and you can find them on the cvesummit.org website, where you can learn more about the research that's currently been going on and the plan ahead, including the specific work that governments have committed to undertaking. Among those are national action plans that should be undertaken collectively, as this conversation has been collective, among governments, private sector, and civil society. And that work, those national action plans, the results from the summits, will all come together again at UNGA. So it's thrilling for me to see the World Economic Forum stepping in to provide an architecture for the, the private sector, which lacks one, and is so essential to this conversation. And the events of yesterday and today have only underscored how vitally important this conversation is and how much of a contribution you all can make to this generational challenge ahead of us. Thank you very much, Under Secretary Siebel. I would now like to go to um, President uh, Yayaga from uh, Kosovo and, and the European on the panel as well. Um, your country has been uh, developing some innovative approaches to deal with this because I think, as we said initially, this is really a global phenomenon. It has to be met by global responses. What is your experience and your recommendation? Mm -hmm. 
Thank you very much. And uh, actually, I want to start by uh, saying how pleased I am to join to this uh, World Economic Forum here in uh, Jordan and to be a part of this uh, uh, panel, which is addressing uh, countering violent extremism, which is definitely a challenge uh, to our stability. It's a challenge to our security and is a challenge to uh, our growth, uh, no matter where we are as a country physically. I want to start my remarks today by echoing His Majesty King Abdullah remarks at the opening session that to defeat the global assault on peace or the violence and the terror we witness today throughout the world, we need a global approach built with security, with diplomacy, development, and the moral leadership. And the question is, how do we do that? As first, the work begins at home. In our own countries, each and every one of us uh, should commit ourselves to strengthen the legitimacy of our state. And the legitimacy is achieved through the performance. We should not only double, but we should triple all of our efforts to pave our way for innovation and for the investment by removing all of the structural and the practical obstacles that are scaring or scares away the investors. The state must be present. The state institution should be visible through the provision of the infrastructure, of the infrastructure, of the energy, of the water supply, of the waste management, of the health care, of education, and of course, on the effective fight against organized crime and the corruption. The state must also lead the reform process. It must be ahead of the curve. And in every step of the decision making, it should invite the private sector in order to ensure them that will favor all of this reform process, will favor the private sector, and it will not limit it. The state must also be accountable towards its citizens. It should allow the citizens to be a part of all of the transition and transformation process that the state is going. The citizens need to be a part of every step ahead of all of these stages and the exercise introduced by the state because we need the ownership. And all of these benchmarks will help strengthen the so much needed, the feeling of the safety and security that is base to any of the prosperity. And the counterterrorism or the terrorism and extremism can be best lift countered by engaging in all the sectors, by engaging all the layers of our societies to promote the inclusion. Inclusion in governance and inclusion in growth. Opportunities should be equal towards all the citizens and towards everyone. No one should be left aside and no one should be kept aside. Because division and exclusions are the breeding ground for the extremism. They explode, exploit divisions and they exploit also grievances. The stories of our countries are the stories of the hardworking people who want a better future for their country, for themselves, and for their families. And we should not allow the extremists or the dark forces of the terror to hijack our vision, our vision for the progress, our vision for the way forward and our vision for the growth of our country and our citizens. And only this way, we will be able to empower the individuals, to empower the faith leaders, to push back and not allow the young people, the young boys and girls, to join to the terrorist causes. And similarly to this is also the international scenes, are this type of the events that is a need for the more dialogue. There is a need for the more cooperation. And definitely, there is a need for the more inclusion. 
And this will bring me to the second point. We are quite aware, and as we see, our borders are not anymore a safe fences. We are all exposed by the different or the same security challenges, whether it comes from the homegrown terrorism or the foreign fighters lured to join the ISIS with distorted ideologies or the financial means. And it falls upon us, country like ours, which are thrived, are thriving for the multiculturalism and multi-ethnicity to context these narratives. And it also falls upon the moderate leaders of the faith to, to rub them from the false interpretation of the religion, which they are using as a justification for the violence and for the use of force. And we must strongly reject it. All of us, no matter where we are physically, we have to show our commitment to tackle this phenomena, to root out the extremism by, strong, by staying together by working together, by cooperating with ours in the diplomacy, but also in the cooperation in the security. And the third is that all of us must make a place or the room around the table for everyone to take the seat. I have seen from my own society, from my own country, that is undergoing the same process of the transformation and transition for the last two decades or three decades in the role. And if I may summarize this in three phases, we have gone from the war towards the peace, from the dictatorship or from the repression towards the democracy, and from the state controlled economy towards the market, free market led economy. And these are the phases and periods that we takes a lot of time, takes a lot of efforts and takes a lot of commitment, not only by the leadership, but also from the citizens, which are the recipient to the other end. Neither Kosovo, neither any country in the southeastern part of the Europe or anywhere else in the Europe has been immune towards this phenomenon. In my country specifically, we have addressed in the three fronts. As first, with a rule of law, with an enormous police and intelligence operation, which end up bringing behind, in the front of justice and behind the bars about two-thirds of the foreign fighters which has been recorded in our country that inspires and incites terrorism, including the imams. In the second front is illegal. We are the, one of the very first countries which have initiated the law which foresees the sentence up to 15 years for all of the foreign fighters which travel outside of the country for that purpose. And the third, we are working with the different foundations, local and international in in initiatives, to address some of the push factors that are making the people to join to this phenomenon. Thank you very much, uh, President Ayaga, and thank you also for sharing the experience of a country that has moved out of violent conflict into uh, a stable uh, modern state. I think there are lessons here to be learned from for other states. We started with Iraq, and I'd also like to end back to the, unfortunately, back to the front line of the of the battle. Uh, Deputy Prime Minister Saleh Mohamed Al Mutlak, uh, how, what do you take of this? What okay. you already heard. Sayyidat wa Sad al Hudur. Ladies and gentlemen, the participants at the outset, I'd like to say that terrorism is not plaguing Iraq alone, but rather it will spill over. And should it spill over the borders, of course, it will undermine stability and security across the whole globe. And that's why the entire international community has to step up its efforts to fight such a phenomenon. Therefore, we cannot expect that Iraq on its own or Lebanon alone or any other third Arab country for that matter can really fight against terrorism without the help of the international community. Terrorism and 
its might and power does not depend on the number of people recruited under one flag like ISIS, but rather it derives its might and power from the feebleness of the communities and societies. And that's why if they are fortified, I mean the societies and communities, they'll be stronger in the face of terrorism and prevented from infiltrating. That's why justice and avoiding the exclusion of the other and to include all stakeholders in the political process would become instrumental to stop terrorism from infiltration and to keep it at bay. And I tell you, had our country been fortified, shielded well uh, under the shield of justice, under the shield of a sound political process, and uh, had the protesters who have spent a year and a half claiming their rights, had all of that happened, had they received their rights, we would have seen nothing of the like. But it's a fact now. Terrorism is there. ISIS is there. Therefore, it's not only our responsibility excluding others. We have to share the responsibility. There are millions of IDPs. You're talking about 3.5 million IDPs as a result of the forced displacement in Iraq. And they're suffering very harsh conditions. And now they're dying out of hunger and thirst simply because they lack international support. And that's why I call upon, through this forum, uh, the international community, and I'm cautioning against an upcoming tragic uh, human tragedy in Iraq. And we have to help those millions, those innocent millions. And their only fault was to stand up against ISIS, or they have become controlled by them simply because the uh, international, uh, because certain forces, either the military or otherwise, have failed to act accordingly, be it a military power inside the country or in the neighboring countries to address what's happening in Iraq. What's happening, what has happened in Iraq is the responsibility of all the countries of the region and not Iraq alone. And if all those countries do not support Iraq, therefore they will all be adversely affected now, Anbar has fell. Now, with the falling of Anbar, uh, there is some symbolism associated with it, just like Mosul. But Anbar is one third of Iraq's square area. And ISIS is achieving advances. And Iraq needs weapons, but no one is supporting us with weapons. IDPs are suffering, and they find no one rushing to their help. Although there are millions of dollars spent here and there, squandered here and there, and still there are millions of people dying out of hunger in a country that has always offered sacrifices for the best interest, uh, best interest of this ummah or nation. And therefore, we need the Arab, support, the Arab countries to rally to our support and the area to support Iraq from a military perspective, and then to develop a region-wide strategy that would delineate the details of getting rid of ISIS and terrorism in general. To make a long story short, I'd rather say that this country has always been subjected to such calamities as a result of a foreign aggression that uh, destroyed its infrastructure uh, and now is, is suffering something that is extra genius, that something that was uh, brought upon it from abroad. That's why everyone is invited to support this country to help it stand on its feet again. Our concern today does not pertain to ISIS and their advances, but rather our concern pertains to the post-ISIS era. Will there be any demographic changes taking place? Will there be any sectarian tensions taking place? All of this can be alleviated if we rush to, uh, in an expedited manner, to address the situation. However, if we procrastinate it further, this means that we are contributing to the further destruction of the Iraqi city's infrastructure and increasing poverty and suffering and social tensions that might, God forbid, uh, 
lead to internal armed conflict as a result of the tensions and differences prompted by the battles taking place there and prompted by the external interventions in order to implement certain agendas. Thank you very much. Thank you much, um, Prime Minister Al Mutak. Uh, I think this is exactly the point that we have to address this immediately and in the long run. And we can't choose either or. We cannot do only immediately or only long run. And I think what's a very important challenge, and I'd like comments from anybody who'd like to pick up on that, how do we make sure that what we do today is also constructive in the long run and not laying the grounds for further challenges? Maybe Mr. Bakit. Okay. Um, oh, perfect. So I think uh, it's incredibly important to shift from a hard security lens and frame of mind into a preventative uh, and a public health uh, lens. What do I mean by that? Wars on laws are not going to end extremism. It might contain it, it might punish those responsible, but it's not going to end our youth joining these extremist groups. With every drone strike, with every war, where every terrorist we kill, there's 100 more being born. Um, and we need to develop a preventative strategy. Uh, and NGOs, the civil society, and the private sector can be incredibly instrumental in helping develop those strategies. We can operate in real time, we can fill in the gaps where governments cannot. Um, and also, I just want to make a, a point. Uh, one of the important things is uh, governments need, to, especially in the Arab world, they need to include civil society and the private sector into the, prop, into the process. There's a monopoly on CVE in the Arab world uh, by uh, the governments and intelligence agencies. Uh, we just want to tell them we're on their side. Uh, we're not the enemies here. And they need our help because they cannot develop the counter-narrative. Any counter-narrative developed by any government is going to be automatically discredited. We, uh, the, the NGOs, private sector communities are the ones who are going to be able to develop those counter-narratives if they're going to be successful. Um, and let me just give you another example. Uh, Jordan just announced the 2025 vision uh, recently. Um, where is the national CVE policy in that vision? In Jordan, we have uh, approximately 7% of the population, according to the government polls, um, uh, identify that ISIS and Al-Qaeda and all these extremist groups uh, uh, represents their views. We have approximately, the official number is anywhere between 13 to 1,500, up to 3,000, according to international estimates, uh, of fighters actually joining ISIS. Well, how about this for a bold goal and a bold vision? Why not, by the year 2025, reduce that number from 7% to 1%? Why not reduce that number, 1,300, 1,500, or 3,000, to 500, or even to zero? Why aren't all those numbers included in that vision? That's because the you know, NGOs, civil communities, the youth were not involved. Um, and you know, whenever I talk to uh, officials, uh, I'm going to say another thing. Probably not going to be speaking again, but anyways. <laughs> uh, it's really incredibly sad and heartbreaking for me um, that uh, today, you know, I was invited at a, at a breakfast uh, this morning, a uh, CVE breakfast, and there were representatives from the Jordanian government and a lot of people from Jordanian uh, society, uh, uh, civil activists, and so on. It's really sad and heartbreaking for me um, that it took the World Economic Forum for me to be able to sit down and speak with those ministers. Why aren't we having those conversations among ourselves right now? What is holding us back? Um, and you know, last but not least, when we're talking to uh, the governments, uh, one thing they always say, oh, this is going to take a long time. This is going to take generations. Yeah, and to echo what, what was said on this panel, the cost of doing nothing, we have done nothing in the last 20 years, and look what we're seeing today. The cost of doing nothing is ISIS. Uh, so we really need to start right now. Um, you know, the time for heroes has always been, will always be right now. Thank you. I assume that, <laughs> thank you very much. I will open for a few questions. We have just a few minutes, but I, I think I feel there is a question being thought about by many participants, which is this. I'm a business CEO. I would like to help, but little me, what can I do? Because this is so complex, it's so big, and my, the action I can take will not have an effect. What's the answer? And if anybody would like to pick up on that, maybe uh, Mr. Jafar first. I think if, the, um, if we have that mindset to want to help, I think that's, that's a very good start. Um, I, I liken this to many orchestras. There is a lot happening, not only in our region, but in many regions. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We simply need to align our efforts. We need to see what orchestra there is. Uh, you said you came from Albania where there was a conference like that. Um, there was one in, in New York. There are um, conferences in, um, in the Middle East. Let's align those efforts together and be focused on the problems that matter 
to each country. So the issues in Iraq will be particular to Iraq. We need a thorough understanding of what these issues are. And then you can get Iraqi uh, companies, but also on a regional basis, we have to own it. I think what you said, that we cannot do it alone, but we must do a lot. We must carry, we must do what we can, because we know our problem better than others do. And others can give us some guidance, maybe, some uh, mentoring or, or some resources, but we have to do some heavy lifting. And um, I think what would be useful after the meeting is over is if we are able to have another meeting, a workshop, a coalition of the willing, as you were. So those who are interested should contact their forum responsible, and we will gather again for a day or two and see what more we can do. We must keep the momentum. We must not go home and do nothing. And we will each bring to the table something that is uh, useful to this, uh, to this venture. If we need an orchestra, we probably need some kind of a conductor as well to bring the thing together. We can bring several conductors and then have a master conductor. <laughs> yeah, <those, laughs> and hope to play the, the same song. Okay, <laughs> the first question is the lady in the second row there. And please, questions rather than comments. Uh, it's, uh, uh, my name is Raghida Dargham of Al Haya and Beirut Institute. And I would, it's okay to ask in English, uh, Dr. Butlaq? Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Uh, may I, when you could answer in Arabic. The question is for both, um, uh, Dr. Alawi as well. The problem with the Daesh uh, phenomena taking over Al Ambar and big chunks of Syria is, is that it's something that is not, we don't understand yet. So who are they? Who is backing them? What has happened? Why is it? happening so fast? Are the remnants of the Ba'ath? Are they some other players from outside? I guess my question is that, do we understand first? Who are they? What, who's supporting them? Why is there not enough support as you just said, Dr. Mitlaq? And in which case are they the same in Syria and Iraq? And what do you mean that you're asking people to just come and help us doing what? Against whom? If, if in fact they are part of our society, thank you. I suggest that we collect uh, a couple of questions so we make sure that we have the floor. First row here, please. Hello, uh, Khatib from Iraq. Uh, <coughs> we are witnessing third world war where the uh, primary was weapon that uh, has been used is radicalism. Uh, there is an international coalition fighting and another international coalition but from foreign fighters known as ISIS before used to be a Qaeda, in the future we don't know what kind of products that uh, the world will produce. Uh, the question is, um, uh, don't you think it's time to hold uh, countries accountable on the literatures and education that they breathe their children, uh, where if you would investigate any of these materials, you will find a lot of uh, radicalizing materials that are uh, breeding uh, future generation to produce more and more um, killers uh, and to basically inject in the society. Thank you. Thank you very much. Then I had a question from a gentleman here on the fourth row. Yeah. Standing there. Yeah. Thank you so much. This is Samar Mubarak from University of Baghdad. I'll pass my question to um, Mr. Alawi and Mr. Mutrik in Arabic just to make sure uh, they will get it uh, on the right way. Uh, yeah, uh, under my English, not under the understanding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, As a matter of fact, we uh, quite uh, appreciate the fact that you're actively participating in the World Economic Forum. Uh, during the previous days, as we were involved in uh, several discussions, the public-private uh, partnership. And everyone knows in Iraq that the GDP during the previous period uh, was on a downward trend, uh, quite notably, actually, uh, with, uh, because uh, probably 90% uh, uh, of those uh, items now we use in Iraq, uh, it's all uh, imported. So we produce nothing, which means that uh, there is lack of job opportunities in the country. And also, this means that we have to transfer foreign exchange and pay it out abroad to import. So what's the strategy 
that you have developed uh, in order to cooperate with the private sector to devise a future plan of engaging that sector in implementing projects for the mixed sector. Fortunately, we have only time for one more question. That's the lady two rows behind. Sorry. The, the lady there has the hands up two rows behind the former speaker. And unfortunately, there will be no time because we have to stick to, we will have to finish it uh, at four. Please. Hello, I'm Yasmin Shahata from Egypt. My question is for the government representatives on the panel. Um, one of the main rallying cries for all radical groups is always injustice, occupation, repression. What are the re government representatives doing to tackle the root causes that leads people to be attracted to these groups in the first place? Thank you very much for those questions. I think we will now, we have now exactly five minutes. Uh, that means uh, 50 seconds per uh, participant. Uh, <laughs> so please pick one question, the one you think is most important to answer, and I will start with Vice President Delavi. Thank you. Uh, frankly, the extremism have started since mankind uh, in ancient history. And I don't think it's going to end uh, at some stage. It's going to continue with us. The, the question is how we are going to minimize and how we are going to control extremism. Uh, I believe that uh, there are many areas that we should look into, but when we talk and speak about the acute phase now, we need to think of achieving victory on the current crisis, the current uh, cause of disturbance in the region by not only degrading uh, ISIS, but getting rid of ISIS. It's not uh, easy to, to lay down the, the groundwork for the future, but believe me, in Iraq, the reason for what we are seeing is the destruction of and dismantlement of the state of Iraq, not only the overthrow of Saddam Hussein, but the state of Iraq was dismantled when the occupation started in Iraq. Then Iraq was put in a framework of sectarianism, which is still affecting the society and eating into the society. And we cannot really achieve stability of the country unless we embark on a genuine course of reconciliation. The rest of the discussions on, on how to, to achieve and what to do and what to, uh, to, how to do it uh, is, is, uh, requires uh, an understanding of the various countries who are allied against extremism. But we need to think of the, the detailed strategies and work on the detailed strategies of this. Thank you very much. Um, we've got three minutes left. So, um, uh, President Jayaga, would you like to say one thing? <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, as, uh, just to finish this, so, because I was writing something. Um, on the specific point that was addressed from the uh, governmental institution. I think we need to address, uh, to promote the inclusion, to address division, and uh, to address also the exclusion. These are the main parts that we need to be focused mm. for every country. And uh, I can speak for hours from our own expert experience and the expertise because my country has been going through the continuous transition transformation for the but past uh, two uh, decades or three decades, we do not have especially hours from this one. <laughs> but no, I can uh, make myself available to give some addresses yeah. afterwards on that I, I one. think we have to... And, uh, but it's about we start this discussion with a shared responsibility. Mm. And I think we are at the starting point, but we need to think also about the end point, about the shared success. And I think we have no time to think about organizing the events, conferences, settings. I think the time has come to act. And now is the momentum that we need to act no matter where we are. And we have to be focused on the shared obligation and in the shared commitment yeah. as the country. And we need to cooperate I, I, I with each we, other. Yeah. And we should uh, exclude and keep ourselves away of the political differences and others. Because my country faces with a lot of political differences with some other countries in the region. And when we speak about the safety and the security of our citizens, I think we should keep this from aside in order to provide the basic thing to our citizens, access to the safety Thank and the you. security. I think we, we, we have to move further. Uh, Deputy Prime Minister, uh, if you have one final uh, Yeah, point. answering the question, 
uh, about who are Daesh and who is sponsoring them. We wish to know who are sponsoring Daesh. It is a very, very big question. Dr. Amr Musa yesterday emphasized on that, and I also have the same worry. Who are they? Who is really uh, supporting them? What are the aims after that? What are the aims after Daesh? What do they want from the region? What do they want from Iraq? Are we going to find a united region as you, we see it now? Are we right, going to see the right countries as we see now? Or, or are we going to see something else? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I simply now have to say that the one of, the, of the three remaining, the one of you who have the most interesting one sentence to say can volunteer. <laughs> Half a sentence. I, I think uh, I delegate my time to my. Okay. <laughs> Same here. I, I will say that uh, at the White House summit, the, to the question of governance, at the White House summit, Secretary General Ban Ki Moon made a very important point. He said, first of all, Governments are very responsible in the sense that they have to be careful that their responses to terrorism do not generate more violent extremism. So they need to think about how they respond, how they use security and intelligence tools. The second point that he made was how governments govern will have a huge impact on the spread or lack thereof of violent extremism. So governance has now become part of this broader conversation about the underlying root causes. I do think that one of the key areas in which the private sector and civil society share a concern about governance is on the question of corruption, which obviously has endemic negative impacts on citizens within a given country, and it might be an area that one could consider collaborating on in the future, anti-corruption initiatives. Thank you very much. Sorry to those of you who did not get the final statement. We're a Swiss-based organization, so we take watches very seriously at the World Economic Forum. Bad news is the watch is for. Uh, good news is this conversation is not over because the World Economic Forum is committed to continue this uh, discourse in the, in the days and weeks and months ahead because we think it's very important and we think that there is a multi-stakeholder contribution and we're, we thank you very much to all of you and, uh, and uh, the, the General Assembly of the UN will be a next meeting point or one of the coming meetings points where more of this will be taken further.